This is the College Football Show presented by AT&T 5G, and we're going to get this thing started right with some good old running back bias. Jared Patterson to the crib, 56 yards out, his eighth of eight scores on the day. And you dag all right, we will get more of that into this show. I can assure you, Trevor Scales, Jason Fitz, here with you on the College Football Show presented by AT&T 5G. We are multi-pronged in the approach and the responsibility is getting you caught up on everything past, present, and future in week 13 of college football. And also, we are coming to you on YouTube, Twitter. Twitter, Facebook, and the ESPN app. We had the first college football playoff rankings drop, and we got to see some some of those teams that uh, made an appearance towards the top and come back to action for the first time in a long time, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on, by the way, Patterson – Bolden, get Buffalo. Uh, it's going to be that way all night. Like, I got my no. Santa blazer, my Santa shirt on. I'm in full Christmas mode, Christmas bear. But you're right. And, by the way, uh, we've got a lot of big games, obviously, going on that involve playoff caliber teams. They're teams that think that they're going to be into that. Uh, but let's get right to it with Clemson back on the field. Trevor Lawrence, first time back in a month. Josh back here. Gets it over to EJ Williams. He's like, oh, yeah, that's what a touchdown feels like. And I like this feeling. Clemson goes up 7-0 later in the game. Travis Etienne, flea flicker back to Lawrence. This is right after a flea flicker went wrong for Pitt, by the way. <laughs> Lawrence throws it to Powell. 43-yard touchdown. Clemson up 17-0. Up 17-0. Travis Etienne says, you know what? I like to score, too. I want in on the fun. Boom! In the end zone, 24-0. Game wasn't even that close. Later, up 31-3. to three. Look at this tough two-yard run. Clemson gets, I mean, just all over Pitt in this game. Not unexpected. Most importantly, look at the hair flip coming right there. Oh, puts that on and then whoop. That's what you do when you got the beautiful locks of Trevor Lawrence. 52-17, to 17, current score. We'll keep you updated. Next up, little SEC action. Number six, Florida hosting unranked Kentucky. Kentucky down 18 players because of COVID-19 protocols. Kyle Trask finds Kyle putting on the pits. Gets a double move, runs away from the UK corner to a 56-yard touchdown. Gators up seven to nothing. Just under a minute left in the first half. Kentucky punting from their own zen end zone. Florida down 10-7. They use two return men to fake out Kentucky. Kendarius Tony gets back for the 50 burger. Presses the speed button. Nobody's gonna touch him. Gators go up 14-10. Take that lead into the half. Early third quarter. Kyle Trask fakes a handoff. Hits Kyle. Who else? Pitts. Oh, the reach. Cradle the baby. Pitts rocks the baby. Gators up 21-10. Kyle Trask finds Kyle Pitts open on the out route for his third receiving touchdown of the game. Later, they go up 31-0. They end up winning 34-10. Woo! Evidently, Pitts took all of the offense uh, right off the top of the show. You're welcome. I am stuck with Northwestern and Michigan State, which is fine. Number eight. Wildcats visiting Sparty and early on Rocky Lombardi to Jalen Naylor gets a start in a 75 yard score to Rocky's credit. Great ball right there. It was over the top. It was on point right in stride to his receiver and they take the early 7 nothing lead. We move to the second quarter now. Michigan State up 10 nothing. Third and five, and Rocky once again finds Jaden Reed this time for the 15-yard score. Part of a 13-play, 85-yard drive for the Spartans. They extend their lead to 17 to nothing. After a couple of Northwestern field goals, they would be within 11. And here, right around the corner on the naked bootleg, Peyton Ramsey, easy money to the crib. 17 to 13, your margin at that point. And then in the fourth quarter, the Wildcats driving, and Cam Porter runs it in for the score. Northwestern would take the lead 20 to 17, and currently Sparty with the 23 to 20 lead. We'll keep you updated there. Moving on to the other Big Ten matchup we'll touch on here in this first block of highlights. Number 12, Indiana at 5 and 1, returns home for their first game since losing to Ohio State. Mid first quarter, Maryland's entire D line jumps off sides, and Michael Penix Jr. would take full advantage, finds Miles Marshall for the 37 yard gain, and on the Later in the drive, Stevie Scott would take things in from the Wildcat formation. Hoosiers go up 7-0. Later in the third quarter, Michael Penix Jr. off the zone read scheme. Quarterback keeper, right sideline. Smooth gain of 21. But the important part is after the play. Down there, very clearly hurt on the play, would lead and not return to this matchup. So two plays later, the Hoosiers working with offense otherwise. Stevie Scott, the third, lines up in the Wildcat formation. One more game and gets in there to make it 17 to three. Early fourth quarter. Second and 18 for Talua Tonga Valoa, who was intercepted by Micah McFadden. Sets up 
First down for Indiana on the Maryland 38, and they would cash in once again with Stevie Scott from the Wildcat formation. Indiana would go on to win 27 to 11. We're still waiting on a word on Michael Penix and his injury stats. Yeah, back-to-back -back games there you called with terrible jerseys. Penn State, Michigan, Harbaugh coming in on the hot seat. Franklin looking to get his first win of the season. Terrible and all of a sudden, terrible teams. Sean Clifford <laughs> fakes to his right. He is faster than Clifford the dog. That is a fact. Outruns a Michigan secondary on his way to a touchdown. Penn State goes up 14-7 in this one. Harbaugh not pleased. Tries to rally the troops. Can't imagine what he's saying under the mask. <laughs> Early fourth quarter, Penn State leading 20-10. Second and one for Michigan on the Penn State three-yard line. Hassan Haskins gets the carry into the end zone. Michigan cuts the deficit to 20-17. to Now, again... A designed run for quarterback Will Levis this time. Takes the snap and follows his lead blocker in. Penn State extends their lead to 27-17. Now we got Joe Milton trying to sneak. Didn't get it. Bidee, bidee, bidee. That's all, folks. Michigan falls upset. Penn State gets their first win of the year. And that hot seat just got hot, 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 hot. I tell Jim you Marble. what, uh, there is no question that Nick Saban is staying right where he is, despite being out this Saturday for uh, COVID-19, testing positive for COVID-19 in the week. Because Alabama continues to roll despite him not being on the sideline. Mac Jones, a Heisman caliber performance, 302 yards, five touchdowns. It helps when you have a receiver like Devontae Smith, 171 yards and two touchdowns for that brother. I mean, can we acknowledge 18 and 26 with five touchdowns at like – 18 completions, five of them went for touchdowns. Efficiency, baby. That's what we call that. Oh, my God. That's what we call that in the Iron Bowl. Not a whole lot of fight that they could put up uh, in the Auburn Tigers against the Alabama Crimson Tide. This is the College Football Show presented by AT&T 5G. And uh, we'll start things out with back in the Big Ten. Uh, noticeably absent in that first block of highlights, as they usually are, are the Ohio State Buckeyes. And their game being canceled late due to COVID-19 outbreak on their own roster and within their staff and uh, entirety of their program puts them in a weird position because they are now having to – Make sure that they play every single game that they have remaining in order to qualify for the Big Ten Championship. You see the full screen here that kind of describes the situation, that teams can miss no more than two games relative to the conference's average number of games played. Ohio State's got two cancellations this season, so it's got to make sure they nail the remaining two in order to get into that coveted Big, title 10, uh, Big Ten title game. But it's not the end-all, be-all, as Heather Dennis will describe to you. If by chance Ohio State cannot qualify for the Big Ten Conference Championship game, but it finishes the season undefeated, that would not eliminate the Buckeyes from the CFP discussion. That's because the college football playoff has not established a minimum number of games that need to be played to qualify for a semifinal this year. Now, what would happen is the Buckeyes wouldn't have that tiebreaker of the conference championship title that the selection committee uses when comparing teams that are similar. So it wouldn't have that on the resume, but we've seen that before because when Notre Dame is an independent, that's exactly how they're treated by the committee as well. Now, Trevor, there's a couple different interesting elements about what's going to happen for Ohio mm -hmm. State. One, they have two games left, Michigan mm -hmm. and Michigan State. Two, they're trying to win the Big Ten. And last time I checked, there's an undefeated Northwestern team, which plays into, by the way, one of the results we're undefeated. seeing right now. Right now. Right now. <laughs> it is 23-20. to 20. Michigan State is beating Northwestern with about 33 seconds left. Michigan State's about to punt to Northwestern. We'll see how that goes, and we will keep you updated on this show. In the meantime – it is going to create like a loss by Northwestern would actually be a dream scenario for Ohio State because I think the nightmare for the Big Ten is that many people feel that the reason they got back on the field this year was to get Ohio State Correct. into the college football playoff somehow. There's a lot of money at stake. So you start to think about now, is the Big Ten going to change their number of game policy? Are they going to wiggle? Or are they going to try and find a way? Because realistically, Michigan State has every right. and We've seen it happen this year where Florida State said, nope, we're not comfortable playing Clemson. Like, Michigan State has every right to turn around and say, no, if you guys got an outbreak, we're not comfortable playing that game. If that happens, I mean, that's it for Ohio State. They won't play enough games to get into the conference championship. Right, yeah. It's a nightmare scenario for the Buckeyes if that were to play out, if they have to drop yet another game. But if Northwestern loses this game, then it makes the resume argument that much easier because then they may be a six-win team but not a loss on their record in Michigan State. Or excuse me, and Northwestern is now the one-loss Big Ten championship if that's how that ends up panning out. So let's loudly remind everybody conference championships are irrelevant. And look, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll say it this way. Conference that champion- part off. Yeah, yeah please do. Uh, <laughs> conference championships give you the opportunity for another big win. That's all it is. It's a resume tick. But in a world where only four teams make the playoffs and there are five power conferences plus the group, I mean, I think we can all acknowledge that tells you that conference championships don't mean anything. And Big Ten fans have been down this road where they've argued that conference championships should mean something. So now what do you do if you end up with, in some miraculous way, depending on the outcome tonight, uh, an undefeated Northwestern Big Ten champion, and now you're looking around saying, yeah, but but Ohio State didn't play enough games, but they didn't lose any games. Like, if I have to bet your house, my house, and all of our houses on Northwestern or Ohio State being a better football team, if those two teams play head-to-head, I'm taking Ohio State. It is without question. But what do you do if you end up with an undefeated Big Ten champion that is not Ohio State? But I'll even say, like, the first edition of the rankings that came out kind of gave us a little wiggle room in a lot of different regards because it was very clearly subjective in nature and how the committee went about assessing, all right, this person just, this team looks better because that's what they're going to have to do a large part of in this year's rankings releases and so because of that if they have that sort of leeway to begin with they can rationalize saying that Ohio State is just the better team how about that well and by the way we're keeping you updated Northwestern has the ball at their own 25 yard line uh, 20 seconds left down by three we'll keep you updated on that Trevor let me ask you this If you were on the college football playoff committee Mm -hmm. and Ohio State didn't play another game this year, Mm -hmm. you're putting them in in the top four? Everybody else takes care of business. Because, right, like the season goes on. Because they're in my, I'd say, top four now, and we'll get to that a little bit later in the show. But there is something to be said about continuing to put together a resume. And so as of now, if the thing were to end and everybody else holds serve and continues to win – No, Ohio State falls out. They have to because, again, it's an ongoing resume thing. And if their ongoing resume stops in week 13 and week five for them, can't do it. Yeah, I'm not. I think you're right. And that's the hardest part. Like, there's no doubt in my mind that Ohio State's one of the four best. But I always say that when people get into this conversation annually, is it the four best or the four most deserving? It is the four best of the four most deserving. That's an important nuance to this. I cannot put somebody that's only played four games in as the most deserving when other teams have played more games and have a better resume at that point. So it, it, that'll be the interesting part of it because it won't just be Ohio State versus a one-loss possible Big Ten champion if they don't get enough games played. It would be Ohio State against Florida, Ohio State against Texas A&M, like all of these other schools, or Cincinnati. You know, all of these other schools that'll look around saying, hey, We've got a body of work. I believe Ohio State's better than those teams, but you got to play somebody. Otherwise, we're just putting anybody in based on what we thought coming in. So as the Big Ten continues to figure out their situation, the Pac-12 unfortunately took a big shot to their hopes uh, last night in Oregon's loss. But the Pac-12 has another game going down tonight in the primetime matchup on ABC. Utah taking on Washington. It is your primetime matchup that you can log in and authenticate uh, via the app and everything like that. Watch along with us. Quickly, I want to tell you that Michigan Michigan State has scored a touchdown on the last play of the game. That seals it. It's a final. Michigan State 29, Northwestern 20. And we'll have more of that. But first, let's hear from On Site, your primetime preview. Well, guys, fun fact, it has been 100 years and a day since the first game that was played at Husky Stadium. It's got a bit of a new look now, and unfortunately no fans here to celebrate the centennial. But it'll still be a fun game on a short week between Washington and Utah after having both of their games canceled. It's a makeshift competition between these two. Washington head coach Jimmy Lake actually said at one point he had four different depth charts spread out on his desk as potential opponents. Uh, It ended up being the Utes. They did have a good first couple of games. They've had no turnovers, no sacks, really dominated time of possession. So they'll look to do the same here today. Utah had a bit of a tough go in their first game against USC. Five turnovers in that game. And their starting quarterback that won the competition in camp went out for the season after just 14 plays. So you're going to see the former South Carolina QB, Jake Bentley, trying to clean up the mistakes in this one. Uh, Should be fun. Looking forward to an awesome contest. Now, this is going to be an awesome contest tonight. And, uh, you know, when you start looking at these two teams, remembering that they weren't originally slated in this time slot, right. I think a lot of people are being introduced to this game. Uh, for this game, there are a couple of keys. Washington, obviously, their ability right now to run the ball, their ability to control the clock, 
their ability to control the line of scrimmage is really, I think, why they're an eight-point favorite, as you see here, against the Utah team that is still shaky and we don't know much about. Utah getting that late start to the season is what throws everybody off, and it threw them off as well in their opening matchup. They ended up taking the loss to USC, didn't look particularly put together in that effort, and so maybe the next week brings a little bit more solidarity in their ability to game plan, a little bit more fluidity and how they're going to go about doing this. But again, as you said, look, Washington's uh, ball security index is a stat that we used to work off of as an offense back in college. It would be through the roof. The ability to just control the football and not lose the game, not turn it over or whatever have you, that's what they are able to do and they do it well. Leave it to, by the way, Trevor Scales, a phenomenal running back at Harvard. And you know, does every school have this ball security <laughs> index? Like, is there a graph? I'm sure, like, that, something like that is appearing like, in every locker room. Was there, like, a spreadsheet? You guys got we, a Google Doc? Yeah, we, we got to have a little empirical analysis, a little homework on top of the homework. So were you, like, analyzing particular players for ball security or just the team as a whole? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it broke down to your individual ball security ranking, rating and the team's ball security rating. That's, it was all of it, That's baby. spectacular. Like, that is the Listen. nerdiest football thing I've ever heard. I love, I love every it. ounce of it. <laughs> and, and to your point, Washington's the only team in the nation that's played at least one game this year and not given up a turnover. They've also only allowed one sack. You're talking about a team that's averaging 250 rushing yards per game, 5.2 yards a carry. I mean, you were talking about a team that's been able to dominate the line of scrimmage, and it's, it is that simple for Washington, who, by the way, especially with Oregon's loss, is looking at it saying, hey, we got a shot at this Pac-12 title. Make a run at it, right? But the Utah Utah are a team that identity-wise controls the line of scrimmage. They are a physical brand of football that will come out and look to establish their own set of circumstances at the LOS. So we'll see exactly how it unfolds. Uh, but in any case, you can make sure you log in to your uh, cable uh, provider, authenticate through the ESPN app or wherever you're streaming uh, these games on and watch along with us. That is your primetime matchup coming up 730 Eastern on ABC. This is what, uh, by the way, one thing that we've noted about this game, as I said earlier, is it was scheduled to be the late game. It was mm -hmm. scheduled to be the Pac-12 after dark, as we all like to call it. Uh, Tom Luganville this week on Rankings Reaction, which just came back on Tuesdays. You can watch it here, the ESPN app, everywhere that. that you usually watch us. Uh, we, we had the chance to talk to Tom Luganville, and he made a really strong point when he said this about Pac-12 scheduling. If I'm Oregon, I'm going to Larry Scott, and I'm saying, listen, Every single 9 a.m. local kickoff you have, we want it. We want that noon Eastern window. We want to be seen on the East Coast. We want that East Coast media to see us. It's our only shot. They should be playing. If they ask them to play at 7 a.m., they should play at 7 a.m. That's why this is a big win, Trevor, because Washington is going to try and make a point that they belong higher, that they belong in the conversation for the Pac-12. Now they get the big national game in this primetime slot. They get the opportunity to really turn around it and maybe shift some of that narrative. That's where these res rescheduled games can help the, the Pac-12. I will say, Tom, uh, 7 a.m., a little aggressive, right? Like, I, I understand that orange slices are a part of the game at halftime in Wee football, but I would rather not have all of that sort of come back to me in a uh, grown man sense. But in any case, I do agree with him in large part in that they want to take advantage of as many possible open visibility time slots as they possibly can in order to build the resume in national perception. They have to in order to get this thing going. Important nerd moment here. Greg McElroy pointed out when we talked to him also that part of the reason that BYU didn't take a game against Washington was because by Pac-12 rule, they can switch whatever game that was added that mm -hmm. was non-conference would have to be switched if a conference opponent became available uh, at least 48 hours before. So the reason they didn't take the game is because with two days notice, it could be taken away from them. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect example of this. Both of these teams had this with different opponents because yep. of COVID. They're now playing each other. This is why BYU didn't want to take a Washington game because there's no assurance it would actually happen. So this is a great moment for the Pac-12, but also a reminder that it's difficult for BYU to figure out how to get into this fold if they know they'll be kicked out for a conference opponent. Right, and, and they know they don't have the same opportunity to take on a Cincinnati and pick them off, right? That's a lot of logistical hoops that they have to jump through as well. So a lot of potential resume building that we would all like to see as fans of the game, just to kind of say hypothetically, we would love to see this team play this team. But there are so many different uh, sort of circumstances that need to be worked through for all of these respective athletic departments in order to even get it on the schedule. So it's going to take a lot for us to kind of figure this thing out. And that's part of what the college football playoff ranking committee is going through as well, trying to make sure that they get a real handle on 
who is able to play whom, and also like what exactly it takes to get the wins that they get. And one important win that was uh, achieved today, again, Michigan State over Northwestern. So the undefeated scenario of Northwestern walking into the Big Ten title game is no longer. That is not a concern of the Ohio State Buckeyes, but still is a very much concern for the game for them as far as just getting back on the field. But back to the primetime matchup. Yeah, before yes. we get to that Michigan State game, we got to make picks. And this is a tough game to pick because we've seen so little from Utah. We've seen so little from both teams. But for me, this one's easy. I'm going to go with Washington because of the way they have controlled the line of scrimmage. So right. uh, I'm, I'm all in on Washington. Who you got in this uh, one? I'm in the exact same boat and based on the uh, ball security index that I mentioned before, right? Like they are dang good at holding on to the ball, not turning it over, and just being efficient with what they do. So Washington for me as well. Yeah, and by the way, Utah not dang good at holding on to the ball nope. in their first game. So <laughs> we'll see how Jake Bentley comes in as their new quarterback. So we'll see what that means. Again, you can authenticate in the app. You can hang out. You can get a, right into that game from here. He's Trevor Scales. I'm Jason Fitz. You mentioned it a second ago. Yep. Northwestern Michigan. Michigan State has been the big uh, result here that all eyes are on. This is 622 in the fourth quarter. Northwestern's Berkeley Holman, uh, by the way, right here, just an awful, Oof. awful injury. He was uh, carted off the field after sustaining a hard hit to the head. We'll show it again here. Obviously, all thoughts are with him and his health and safety. That is the most important part of this. He was carted off the field uh, in the process. Yeah, of this. and it was just one of those plays where it's part of the collision sport that is football. Uh, and, and it was just really unfortunate to see, but uh, obviously is, hoping that he's well. But this is the final play and how it unfolded. Yeah, and this is how the, the game came to an end, an attempt to try and get some work done there. It turns out the wrong way. So it was really a 23-20 game that became a 29-20. Mel Tucker, new coach for Michigan State, has two significant wins. I mean, you think about Michigan State right now is 2-3, and three, but they got a win over a top-10 Northwestern team, and they beat Michigan. So if you're a Michigan State fan and you knew it was going to be a rebuilding year anyway, you get a top-10 win, you get a win over Michigan. Mel Tucker actually has to feel pretty good about a Sparty team that I've been tough on that went in and, and really got it done today. No, given the circumstances, given just the uh, hurdles he had to jump through just to get this season off the ground, right? You'll take those two wins any day of the week. Honestly, in a regular season under normal circumstances, you'll probably take that as a first-year head coach. And so, look, again, props to the Michigan State uh, football team for getting this one, gutting this one out, but they are – the prime suspects of just coming out, mucking the game up for the opposing team, and just making it so difficult for you to get anything going. Yeah, I mean, at this point, good luck trying to figure out how to rep the Big Ten in general without Ohio State in the conference. And you're absolutely right. Like, this is a tough Michigan State team to figure out, too, because their defense has been maddeningly inconsistent week to week. One week it feels like they swarm. The next week it feels like they're overwhelmed. It's maddeningly consistent, inconsistent. We joked today as we were watching the game, Rocky Lombardi will give you highlights that make you think they've got a quarterback. And then you actually watch the game in its entirety and – it is sometimes painful. So he's got wide receivers that I think have the capability to play on Sundays. And then it's just it's it's incredibly inconsistent on his ability to even get him into. He'll you know, have a couple in this game. You'll see some highlights that make it look like Rocky Lombardi is just absolutely a monster. And then you watch the rest of it and realize he might be more Frankenstein right. than monster quarterback. <laughs> that is exactly that's so well said. It's so well put. Uh, Jason Fitz, Trevor Scales here with you on the College Football Show presented by AT&T 5G. We done ran through quite a bit that went down on Saturday, but plenty went down on Friday as well. And in the spirit of Thanksgiving, we have your Thanksgiving football leftovers. We'll begin in the Pac-12, Oregon and Oregon State, the matchup formerly known as the Civil War. Number 15, Oregon playing host, and uh, it was Jamar Jefferson for the Beavers, giving things cracking for them early on. Jefferson, am I right? <laughs> yeah, you're the worst. 82 yards stripped to the crib uh, to tie things up at seven. Jefferson, by the way, 226 yards on the ground, most of any player in the rivalry's history. Second quarter. Now, Oregon working with the football. Tyler Shuck on second and 21 from his own 40, running a shuck it up drill, if you will. I took that one from Shuck Jason. and Chuck? No. I gave the pun. It stays there. There's no need to one up that Shuck and Chuck? We could have okay. let that live. 21 10 year score at that point. 43 seconds to play, though. This was where just insanity ensued, frankly. We were down at this point of the field for a solid 20 minutes of real time, <laughs> despite there being 43 seconds to play in the game. Tristan Jebbia keeps it on the QB sneak, doesn't get in. Then, the next play, 
I don't know if y'all saw, but a flash of yellow went way across the line of scrimmage before it was allowed to, and I guess we just let that run. You'll see I mean, it on the replay. How do you not see it when you're wearing neon Correct. yellow? It, that's the one person you should see moving when they ain't supposed to move. But I digress. He was stoned once again, and on that play, he ends up getting hurt, and so he comes out for the game with a lower leg injury, and so now you're having Chance Nolan, a transfer, walk in, and he gets a chance to win this thing. See what you did? He gets a chance. Yes, I, I yes, Fitz, quit wanting up my puns. <laughs> one up my puns. Stop it. Fourth and goal. They go up 41 to 38 after the extra point, the last chance for Oregon. One play to win. It's a little hook and lateral from Tyler Shuck, and it doesn't pan out to much at all. Fumble on the play. Oregon State recovers, and there you have it. The upset of the evening. 41 to 38, Oregon State gets the win in light of their starting quarterback going down at the goal line there. So that was one heck of a start. Oh, shucks. To the Thanksgiving leftovers. Oh, shucks. Okay, I'll give All you right. that. That was acceptable. Let's get to Ohio, oh, wow. Iowa State taking on Texas. Sam Ellinger's last home game keeps it himself right out of the gates. He's like, you know what I want? If this is going to be my last chance to hang out here, I'm going to go 17 yards to get my own touchdown. Texas goes up 10-0. But Iowa State, not to be outdone. Brock Oso oh Purdy passes to Sean Shaw Jr., who presses the spin button here, goes whoop, wig, wig, wig. Oh, swiggity swooty is coming for that booty. What? Yeah, it's a thing. All right. Ellinger <laughs> <laughs> here. Airs it out 45 yards to Brennan, better than the Eagles. Gets the first down. What a catch. Again, better than the Eagles. Moving forward here now, Ellinger finds Jared Oso oh Wiley getting Wiley in the back of the end zone for the wow, touchdown. Texas goes up 20 to 10. Purdy says, you know what? I will not be outdone. Dylan Sonner for a 22 yard reception there. They're driving. Unfortunately, he comes up limp. But here, Purdy finds Charlie Kolar for the 17 yard reception. Oh, they're moving down the field. And. They leave it to Brees Hall to finish everything off on that drive. Iowa State goes up 23-20. Cyclones feeling pretty good about it. But Ellinger passes here to Jordan Winningham. Runs for the first down, and it looks like Texas might be back in the game. Creeping in the field goal range. Look at that. Creeping in. Problem is, Ellinger here just holds it, holds it, holds it. What's he looking for? Get rid of the ball. Oh, oh no. No. Sack. But it's only a four-yard loss, right? It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. They got Dicker the kicker. Oh, the problem is he's just a bit outside. Had all the length you could ask for, but just a little bit out. 23-20. Iowa State keeps their lead in the Big 12. Big win for them. Sticking in the state of Iowa. Nebraska, Iowa. This is not as uh, sexy of a matchup. Take a look at Keith Duncan. Kicking it. Oh, he aimed for this, right? Wait a minute. Bang! It's the, uh, you see the, the swerve crossbar? on that ball, by the way? Yeah. Like, yeah, that was wild to begin with. Well, and now you got Adrian Martinez coming here. Wandale Robinson finding him for an 18-yard gain. That was a heck of a catch. Puts him in Iowa territory. And that works for a second. Problem is, on the next play, Martinez gets himself sacked. Fumbles. The ball recovered by Zach Van Valkenburg. He secures oh. the fumble. Iowa recovers the ball. Look at this. Look at that. That's good if it's a pick or a fumble, baby. Yeah, that's beautiful either way. Iowa holds on for the 26-20 win, and it is frosty in Nebraska. Uh, there, that, I'll allow it. Okay. I'll allow it. Yeah, Kirk good. Ferentz also throwing some shade on that uh, game in the postgame press conference, but I digress. Notre Dame, North Carolina, the upset that mo- many people thought we may have seen. One of those people might be sitting next to me right now, but Oops. that's neither here nor there. Sam Howell. Heisman hopeful gets things started with the catch from Emory Simmons that my goodness it is worth running it back give us one chance to do just that I want to uh, make of note number zero coldest number out in college football right now number two my man going up and over and making that grown man look like a child in the process of making this six point grab is amazing as well Tar Heels would lead seven nothing Notre Dame would tie things up at seven but Sam Howell and them weren't done offensively rarely are they ever this time Howell going over the top, deep down the middle to Diami Brown for setting up at the one-yard line. So, first and goal, Howell on the inside zone. Keeper splits the defenders and sneaks himself in there. How about UNC? Up 14-7. to 7. 
But again, I it was, was feeling confident that you were. I know you were. And then Ian Book had to go and do this to you. Just he's, take he's, your soul. 33 yards down inside the 10 yard line. It steps up first and goal for the Fighting Irish. And two plays later, second and goal. Book. Back to throw, scrambles around. We got the tracker to see just how much he ran. Maybe it was unnecessary. Maybe it wasn't. But either way, <laughs> it tracked to seven points going up on the board. Irish side of game at 14. It would lead or they would be tied at 17 at the break. Early third quarter now. Ian Book back to work. Gets the hard count. North Carolina jumps off sides. Mac Brown not having because Dad Gummy, he can't get his team to stop committing penalties. Later in the drive, it's Ben Skoranek on the end of the round, and he's in there for six nice and easy 13 yards out. LeBron James taking note of this game, thinking the same thing that we all are. Damn good game. I'm all for it. Mama, I'm sorry for cussing. I know you're watching, but it was on the screen, so I had to read it. Uh, in any case, Ian Book and the Irish going back at it one more time. 545 left, and Kyron Williams, a big Long run, 47-yard gain. Notre Dame trying to put this ball game away later in the drive. First and goal. Why not give it to Kyron Williams after you go 14 personnel? All the tight ends in the world, I think they took somebody from the Tar Heels to put on their sideline. All the tight ends in the world lining up. Notre Dame punches it in. LeBron James, a fan of it all, especially the silencer celebration on the back end. Notre Dame wins 31 to 17. So with all that being said, you see the final score up there. And my man Jason Fitz. Talking spicy about the Irish. We done had Jordan Cordette a couple times kind of defending the fighting Irish. I just want to allow you the space to, you know, say your piece, whether it be, you know, continuing to knock them or just accepting your crow. One thing I will always do, I will always admit when I'm wrong, whether it's I misspeak, whether it's when I, I misanalyze, when I'm just wrong, I will always admit it. It's the best thing I can do, to be honest with you guys. <laughs> it is time to admit that I was wrong about Notre Dame. And I'm not just saying this because Jordan Cornette and Michael Oluk Jr. are substantially larger than I am. It has <laughs> nothing to do with that. I think my problem is I have spent every single week looking for the flaw. We keep thinking about the times that Notre Dame's been in these situations and hasn't gotten it done. And it sort of it just creeps into your mindset. I've been looking for the, the hole in the game of Ian Book. I've been looking for the hole in the game of the offense. At the beginning of the year, I underestimated the team's speed they have defensively. I underestimated their ability to swarm and tackle. They've done that incredibly well. I underestimated how effective Swaronic would be, how effective uh, Williams has been. I underestimated Baby Gr like, I feel like across the board, this team has just developed week in and week out. And while it was easy in the beginning to say, hey, maybe they have a shortcoming, all I'm seeing now is whatever shortcoming I think they have every single week, they address it, and they address it definitively. I am sorry, everybody. I have been wrong about Notre Dame. They are clearly a great football team this year, and I absolutely misread that. Now, while I understand and appreciate the fact that you can acknowledge that you were wrong in a sense, I do want to acknowledge the fact that, look, I don't think that there's ever really been a huge Achilles heel that's easily identifiable for a Notre Dame program year in, year out, as we see them sort of progress to these undefeated seasons and these undefeated strings. Usually it comes out of nowhere. It's not that we weren't expecting it, but what ends up leading to their demise isn't something that was easily identifiable from the jump. And so for this team specifically, I think what has changed is a mental thing. Kirk uh, Herbstreit mentioned it on game day. It's a mentality with this Notre Dame team that isn't the same as years past. It's one that is understanding of how good they are, but also understanding as to how prepared they have to come each and every week in order to get the results that they want to. And when you're sitting there with the college football playoff committee, at some point you're going to look at the wins and the losses. They have no losses. They have wins over a, a team in North Carolina the committee still felt was a top 20 team. They have a win over a Clemson team that the committee told you, even in a loss, they still think is a top team. Like, what else do we need? I mean, at some point, resume matters. And resume matters to who have you beaten, who have you lost to, and what have you looked like in the process of that? There are small cracks in the armor for every one of the top teams at different times this year. The question is, when was it and how have they looked since? So the offensive failings for Notre Dame were early in the year. I mean, they've fixed that. They've looked better. Much like I've, I've said that Alabama's defense should be held to a, a standard because they looked bad a couple of times. Well, they seem to have righted that. You know, you look at Notre Dame, you look at Alabama, you look at these teams and say, how have they recovered from whatever their weaknesses are? That's something that I think Notre Dame has really addressed this year. And right now, if you're asking me who the two best teams in the country are, it is Alabama and Notre Dame. And until Clemson goes out and beats Notre Dame, I think that's fair. Without question. And so we've started the college football playoff discussion. Let's get a little bit more into it. Five, four, three, two, one. Liftoff. 
Trevor Scales, if there's one thing I know, if you were making your list and checking it twice, the only <laughs> thing better than Fitz's five might be this fire Santa outfit. Got the shirt with the little Santa yeah, Claus, the jacket. Yeah. Look at all your Christmas needs coming. I'm not mad at it. Go ahead. This. Tis okay. the season, baby. Well, tis the season to go ranking. So, uh, in honor of that, let's talk about the first CFP rankings brought to you by Allstate. They were revealed by the committee this week. Everybody's seen it. Here's 10 to 1, Miami, Georgia, in at number 9, Northwestern, 8, Cincinnati, 7, Florida, 6, and this is where it gets into Interesting. Texas A&M at five, Ohio State at four, behind a one-loss Clemson team at three, at number two, Notre Dame, number one, Avalama. So, now, that obviously <laughs> gives you what the rankings committee thought, and while I think that the committee should put me in with the group just because sure. of this outfit, sure. I mean, what says Fine. respect me like this, right? <laughs> but in honor of ranking things, let's do our rankings yes. here. So, we're going we're gonna to pretend we're on the committee here, and we're going to give you our top five. Yep. Now, uh, we'll do it uh, We'll do it the way they do. How do you want One through five or five through Let's one? Let's go Here, one through five. Okay. I think there's more mystery at the bottom. One through five. I've got Alabama at number one. I've got Notre Dame at number two. Mm-hmm. These were pretty easy. I still believe that a loss matters in college football. So, Ohio State goes in at number three because last time I checked, I don't care about what you were missing. Clemson lost a game. So, that gets me one through four. But now, am I a fraud? Because a loss should matter, which means I should. And you know, yep. I've been the king of the Cincinnati bandwagon. I want to put Cincinnati in at number five. Yeah. I can't do it. Why is I that? I can't do it because there is one team right now that looks like they are better than Cincinnati to the eye test, and their resume is better. Florida goes in at number five. Now, before AM fans at me, there's a very simple rule when you make the Ten Commandments of the college football playoff. Right. Now, shout, not get blown out. What happened to AM? They got AM doors. got that butt whooped by Bama. So, because of that butt whooping, even though they beat Florida head to head, and this makes everybody go crazy, Florida has some big wins on their resume. They've got the one loss, it was a close loss to AM. I put Florida in at number Number five because I also believe that if those two teams played today, Florida would win. So you know that's what? My five. I, I could go either way now because you set me up to go either one through five or five through one. But I will actually do the inverse of how you counted yours down. I understand what your point is about Florida. Some big wins, right? Including Georgia, who is now the number nine team in the nation. But I don't think that that ranking is even valid. So because of that, I take away that also oh valid win because I don't believe that Georgia is that good to begin with. So I'm going to slate Cincinnati in at five because I do Ooh. believe in the power of their wins and Ooh. just how dominant they are. Yes, we are going to get spicy in this thing in that four I'm actually going to switch again your logic here and go Ohio State I don't believe that we've just seen enough from Ohio State yet it's not that they haven't been good in every time that they set foot on the field but yes Indiana give me did give me a little bit of light on what their Achilles heel may be in at three I will go Clemson based off of the performance that we saw today over Pitt dominant in every facet of the game uh in at two Notre Dame because we all know that and then one Alabama because we all know that as well. DB, you might want to watch that secondary for Ohio State. Like, I always get see what I did there, DB. Did. You're welcome. It's good. Uh, all right, so that's our top five. I'm sure Twitter will have plenty to say about it. But that's not the only area that there's been some controversy. Let's take a look here at what the committee told us about 11 through 20 because there are some key teams here. First of all, as you look at the rankings here, I mean, it's easy to look at Oregon. We know now that Oregon's lost. That mm-hmm. changes some things. North Carolina obviously wasn't able to be much of a push here but the Mm -hmm. number that everybody's got their eye on is 14 for BYU I do think 12 for Indiana is a little bit that's the other one I was going to draw a little attention to as well they are telling you hey we think Indiana is a good team and a valid opponent but 14 for undefeated BYU so the question is how's everybody feel about that in fact this is what their head coach Kalani Sataki had to say about their ranking I think we're a really good team. You know, I, I understand the position that the, the committee is in. It's a difficult year. It's hard to, to, to determine a, a team that's played nine games to a team that's played three. And, and I don't envy their position. I just, I'm going to fight for our boys. I believe in our team. I believe in our depth. Uh, from the very beginning going into this season, we were really excited about their depth on this team. And I want to make sure everybody understands we're not afraid of anybody. We will respect everyone that we play, but we, there's no fear in this. But it's not anything unique to us. Uh, That's what makes college football great. Nobody's afraid of anybody. You know, uh, we're not afraid of Washington. They're not afraid of us. Uh, That's why we dedicate our lives to this game. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we can we can do a lot. And to be honest with you, we have uh, two weeks left that are open December 5th and December 19th that we're willing to play football. And, uh, you know, if there's anybody that are actually have an availability to play those games, we would love to do it. 
actually have an availability, T-Scales. Like, that's the most important part of this because right. it's easy for everybody to yell and scream about the fact that BYU didn't take Washington. But today we see why, right? Because the Pac-12 rules say that if a conference opponent is available, they have to fill it with a conference opponent as long as they give 48 hours uh, notice. So yep. in this exact instance, if BYU had taken Washington – that game would go away. Would have been washed. And, sure. and we have to also give uh, an amount of credit to BYU for scrambling the schedule that they did to this point. I understand that it was, in the committee's words, there weren't any quality wins that you saw on that schedule. But, like, we're going to have to look at Texas A&M then. We're going to have to look at Florida then in those same regards to say, like, look, I understand that there is an understanding of the level of play within that conference of the SEC. But I also don't think that we can't just take a grain of salt at the same time and also appreciate the fact that BYU has done more over that same span of time uh, in regards to just the amount of winning that they've done. That's such a smart point by you because it, every year we sit there and say, yeah, but what if Cincinnati had played an SEC schedule? What if BYU was playing an SEC schedule? That's always the conversation. Well, this year, there are a lot of really bad football teams yeah. in the SEC. There are a lot of trash football teams in the Big Ten. So, I mean, I could conversely look at Ohio State and say, who have they beaten? Now, I understand that we all know how good Ohio State is, but can't we watch BYU and know how good BYU is as well? I, 14 feels raw to exactly. me, for, for especially in a world where, no offense to your Georgia Bulldogs, but two losses, and they're sitting in the top 10. I can't right. figure that out. And, and, and Oklahoma at 6-2 and two is sitting above Indiana, and I'm trying to make sense of this at the uh, benefit of the doubt to the committee, but I'm just having a hard time assessing the teams in the same exact way that they are, because a lot of these things just aren't necessarily making since given the, you know, value of opponent that we're going to attach to each of these records. Consistency is going to be key from this committee because more than ever, this is an eye test committee because the resumes are so diff different. That's why I think this year particularly, we've got to keep our eye on how the committee tells us what they tell us next week and the week after. How consistent are they on the way they view these teams? Because if this is going to be consistent, BYU needs to desperately get something scheduled. So is the season of subjectivity. Bruh, 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 now that bruh, we've had bruh, bruh. the good discussion, it's time to get some jokes off. This is Bruh, delivered by Pizza Hut. And uh, Fitz, you ready to get some more pun games going? I or? mean, my pun game has been strong, almost as strong That's, as this blazer that today. That might be an overvaluation. Let's fire up the clips. The first one comes to you from Florida, Kentucky. And I just want to point out one thing. Great on the punt return, 50 yards back to the crib. I'm so excited for you pulling off a trick play scheme. But evidently, the punter was supposed to kick it to the left. He didn't kick it to the left. Beyond that, the personal protector has a responsibility to say that it's going right. Look what the way he points. He points left. What are you doing? Why are you identifying the wrong way when you heard and saw the ball get off of the punter's foot? This feels very personal. Like, this feels like it's about something else. Did you play some special Because it's just that daggone split. It's, it's just that simple. Just be better. It's, 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 are we hitting a little nerve? Like, did I you just, have an issue? Like, is there a special team story that Trevor yeah, Scales wants I just, to I, I get frustrated because I was a gunner in special teams, and if I run my black ah. behind all the way down there and y'all run it to the wrong side and I get dooted on, like, no, that's not okay. In any case, next bro moment, hot. Hockman, Bailey Hawkman. Oh, yeah. Oh, wrong way. Yeah. You're going the wrong way. It's How do they simple. know which way we're going? It's <laughs> that was good. That was good. Thank you. I'll allow it. <laughs> yes. I will allow it. <laughs> I mean, there is a moment here where like I get like I get why I would panic about to be sacked. <laughs> I'm not a quarterback. Like yeah. that should just, just got to be better. You're not supposed to do that, Bailey. Bailey, you gotta just you, cut your losses, big dog. Cut your losses. That's not what you need to be doing. Uh, onside kick. Oops. Did did anybody from the Texas Tech kickoff team know that it was an onside kick getting ready to pop off? Because it looks like 2-4, two, 2-2, two, two, all running right on past the football. Wasn't nobody concerned with it. And wow. so you, you get a lead, you try to capitalize and get in a lead that you didn't expect, and that's what happened. This is the one thing I don't understand, though. Like, what else do kickers kick, like, practice all offseason? Don't, don't worry about field goals. Just hey. worry about onside kicks hey, all look, day, every day. Like, you will never it's your hear, job. You got one job. You won't hear me say this ever again, but in defense of the kickers, it is very difficult to do. In any case, moving on to the next one, uh, Dan Mullen and Todd Grantham getting after each other on the sidelines. Let me tell you, as a personal uh, experience from players, you see number 40 over there, and you see how he kind of listening in to people getting ripped? That's what I'd be doing, too. I'd be I do like the way, the like, time. on his mask, the side almost looks like the Gators talking on the side of his mask. <laughs> yeah. And I also love the fact that Grantham's gone with the full chin diaper. Like, right. what are you doing? That's what, Like, you're being chewed out by somebody <laughs> wearing a mask. At least pull yours up. Pick it up. Uh, Syracuse quarterback Rex Culpepper Pepper takes a sack on third and goal. Right? And here's a sack. 
Uh oh, not great. Um, and then decides, hey guys, we're gonna run the clock play. We're gonna run the clock play. Only problem, buddy, it's fourth down. <laughs> Oh my God. Ball game. Oh my God. <laughs> like, if you're on the winning sideline here, are you looking at it saying, no, this can't be real? Like, Look no. at the reactions. Look at the reactions up top of the screen where they're like, oh God, he's going to do it. He's going to clock the ball. Like, and it's just. Sure oh. enough. Yeah. Hey, here's your win. <laughs> right and the, the celebration starts. Good Lord. Gracious. Javon Hiley scores for Coastal Carolina. And then decides to have a couple words with the Texas State defender. Um, I know that we're probably supposed to condemn this, but I just find it hilarious. <laughs> so I am just going to get a couple chuckles out of this one here. Like, yeah, talk all the noise you want. Also, you have no gloves on. The swagger is like at an all-time low in your uniform, so you just got to be careful. I mean, like, if you're the defender, what are you talking about there? You just got burned. Yeah, and then uh, this one here. I, I have my little tangent in the highlight. But I, I just, just everything about this whole sequence, about it taking 20 minutes to finish the last 43 seconds of game time in a matchup that had nowhere near as interesting gameplay throughout the duration of the game as it was towards the back end of this. But it was just a mess in a host of different regards. And I, I just, why did it take so long? Nah, as why much turkey so as we know you'd eat and, like, leftovers still happening on Friday, like, I would have thought that you would have liked this. Like, give you a little bit more time to... Digest your food? Yeah. No. No? No, no, no. Didn't do it for me. I was just angry. I, I did not appreciate it. Next up, we're going to get some good vibes in here. you love to see it. What? This feels so... Like, I like the music. Yeah. The intro felt so good. It, it did. It's All right. nice. I'm going to give some love to Vandy. And, and we've seen this a lot today, uh, but I think it's appropriate to give it even more love. Vanderbilt football has had an atrocious year. I won't take anything away from that. Uh, anybody that, that knows me knows I lived in Nashville for a very long time. Uh, I, I consider Derek Mason to be a, a great man of a coach. Uh, he's a great human being. He showed some of that this week in deciding to give an opportunity, knowing that they needed a kicker, to Sarah Fuller. She becomes the first woman to play in a Power 5 game in college football history. So, uh, sorry, it says a FBS football game. She's the third woman, first ever in a Power 5 right there when she gave the opening kickoff of the second half. Now, we could crack a lot of jokes about the fact that Vandy got blanked, so we didn't get to see her kick a field goal. I hope that that happens for her, but more importantly, I hope that every girl that was watching across the country today that was looking for some opportunity to say, hey, I want to do that. Look, I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what gender you are. I don't care what, what your sexual your sexual preference is. You help a team win a game. That's all that matters in the entire world, and Vandy let that happen today. It truly was a beautiful thing, and she was there to provide encouragement and uh, inspiration to a lot of different people, and uh, we'll hear from her now. Honestly, I was just really calm. Uh, the SEC championship was more stressful, <laughs> if I'm going to be honest. Um, but I was, I was really excited to step out on the field and do my thing. So, If you're not aware, this is the SEC championship she was referencing. As remember, she is the goaltender for Vanderbilt's women's soccer team that just won the SEC championship. Right, right. So uh, for her to say that uh, this is, you know. That this is a low-pressure moment for right. her. <laughs> like, this, this is where it was tense. I mean, and, and kudos to her. By the way, uh, the women's soccer team uh, coach at Vandy and Derek Mason, the football coach, close friends. And that's part of how all of this came together, that there's been this uh, constant communication and there are no doors uh, that the doors won't open. And it's all so incredibly dope, right? Reese Davis said it on college game day this morning that everybody on the Vanderbilt football team refers to her as champ because she's the only one that's got a ring in anybody in that locker room, straight up and down. And, and so it, they have to refer to her with deference. And as was reported today by a couple of different reporters, Vanderbilt's quarterback said that she got up at halftime. She was the one that got up and said, guys, we, got, we need more energy. we got to get out there and play. And on some of these first downs in the second half, she was the one that was standing up and cheering. So so it's a, it's a bit of a statement to what's happening right now and how off the rails the Vandy season has gotten, uh, that, that she has to be the leader when she's been there for a few days. But it's also a statement to her that she's able to come in and to the culture that Derek Mason has created there, that she can come in and be that leader. Overall, salute to Sarah Fuller. Let's keep the good things going. Holy cow, rolling into you for the college football show presented by AT&T 5G. Now to get to your top plays of the day, we're going to get right to it, like literally right to it. Ain't no need for me to explain any more than this. It is Trevor Lawrence on the flea flicker. Uh, 
absolute dime for the score. Bear Booty Open was the receiver in Cornell Powell, a 43-yard score, part of the absolute romping that the Clemson Tigers handed to the Pittsburgh Panthers. Uh, and this is this is cool or whatever, right? Like, I, I can always appreciate a gadget play goes over the top. But look, man, we, we're supposed to come to expect this from Trevor Lawrence and the Clemson Tigers, right? We expect them to just look flawless in every single facet of the game. So when it comes to rating this, I have to understand that. And I give it an 80, right? I, I'm happy with it. I'm not going to knock you for it, but we, we've come to expect that. Uh, I mean, I think that's uh, skewing your expectation. Let's go here. Dwayne Eskridge. Turns on the burners for Western Michigan. Look at this. Just flying. Just flying. And nobody can even get a hand on him. But I love that little angle he took there. It was finding that seam and that angle and then watching him run away from everybody. It put Western Michigan back on top of Northern Illinois with that return. Now, you know I've been tough on returners. That yes, I think because just, you hate people that are fast. Just evidently. press the speed button. But look at this. Look at this. Yes, there's a nice block for him. But uh, he, he just outruns everybody. And then that right there, that little move, ah. Uh, I mean, I got nothing but love and respect for it. Okay. So, I was asked to judge this one to give it a score. Maybe I'm just soft, not just in the midsection after uh, Thanksgiving. 92 coming on this one. To your first comment, we all are. To your second comment, I just – there's no rhyme or reason to whatever you – That do. was his speed rating on Madden would be 92. So, that's why I got a 92. That's fair. Here's a flea flicker from Eastern Carolina. What, do you get all the flea flickers today? I like it. I like them. Uh, it, well, it's not necessarily a flea flicker. It's like – Handoff reverse to a double pad. Like, it, you get I, the I trick plays. Yes, gadget play is what I'm just going to throw this under the umbrella under. Solid play, solid effort. 83. I can appreciate it, but it's not going to knock my socks off. That's wow, all. You are a tough judge today. I was an offensive coordinator in a past life. All right, look at this. Look at this, Superman. Oh, when you lay out, look at that effectiveness. They tried to flea flicker, but no. I mean, WWF, like, <laughs> 80s off the top rope, macho man coming Jimmy across. Jimmy Superfly Snooker. I was more of a macho man guy, but that's Fair okay. Enough. That's okay. I mean, and even though the gloves helped him, he still comes up with God. the pick in the process. Again. I love when you can just Superman like that, and I'm feeling fluffy after the holidays. 90. Okay. I, again, there's zero consistency. When you're your wearing rating. a Santa jacket, you give. Yeah, okay, that's fair. He's feeling jolly, and I respect it. Matt Corral also feeling jolly. Uh, just chuck it up, Drew. 81-yard score. About 70 of it through, was through the air. Finds Braylon Sanders on the end of this one, and it was just a dime, right? Like, DB was in phase. Didn't matter. He reels that in. Uh, Mrs. Ole Miss actually goes on to win the Egg Bowl, by the way, as a part of this effort put forth by Matt Corral. I'll give it an 80. I'm just... I am are, mildly impressed. You are jaded. I'm mildly impressed. That doesn't mean that I have to be hating. All right. Well, let's see if you hate on this running back, love. Jared Patterson from the Buffalo Bulls. I want to give you one play, but I can't. The stat line there is not a mistake. 409 rushing yards, eight touchdowns on 36 carries. That's right. 409, eight tutties, 36 carries. That is a Trevor Scalesian type <laughs> effort if I've ever seen one. He ends up with the second most rushing yards we've ever seen by a running back in one game. Now, over the last two games, he set a record for most rushing yards and then the eight touchdowns on top of it. This is a level of just absolute butt kicking. And don't look now, but the Buffalo Bulls in the MAC have not just beaten everybody, they have thumped everybody. Lance Leipold has built a program for Buffalo that is absolutely out there embarrassing the other teams in their conference. Good on them. This is a team that lost its opportunity this year because of the cancellations to play Ohio State. And I realize that I'm not saying they would have beaten Ohio State, but they lost a lot of money, yeah. a lot of momentum, a lot yeah. of shine that comes with that game. It has not deterred them in this season. They have come out and they have shown what Buffalo Bulls football is all about. Jarrett Patterson, eight stinking touchdowns. I mean, it's inspiring. You know what's crazy about games like this? And again, I have never matched that stat line. I'm not going to sit here and act like I have. But even on my best days, when you feel like you're extra productive, those are the days where you feel like you're unstoppable. You're, you all of a sudden have all the conditioning in the world. Like, I, yeah, Coach, I'll take, I'll take any more cares you got for me. Uh, they evidently pulled them out 20 yards short of the record, but that's all good because the man was clearly getting plenty of work before that. And, and look, 
shouts to the O-line because, good Lord, they were helping him out too. He wasn't touched on a lot of these runs, and that's a large part of how you get to this level of productivity. That's still giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. 409 no right there. 409 no rushing yards. Absolutely great. Ed, I got to give it a rating. Yeah. It gets Crank the double move. Up. Yeah. You get the double move. Yeah. Solid 100. Yeah. Woo! You Good see effort. why I downscaled a little bit? Because I can't be handing out anything near the A rate because we knew that that was coming. All right, well, you know what? Santa Claus has no limits to the greatness of presents <laughs> that are in the sleigh. I'm going to do this whole December, too. So <laughs> Man, just, just yeah, be ready just for get it. Just get your mind right for the Man. holiday puns. They're coming to you live right here on the College Football Show presented by AT&T 5G. And uh, we got a couple more highlights to get to, so why don't we go ahead and get right to them. The Egg Bowl that I mentioned. Matt Corral throwing dimes all over the place. Well, we got a bit more of a highlight for you. We pick things up in the first quarter. No score until Dontario Drummond is on the receiving end of a 48-yard score to put the Rebels up 7 to nothing after the extra point. Later in the first, one of the greatest names in all of college football, Snoop Connor. Snoop Connor, come on. From one yard out, Ole Miss up 14 nothing. The second quarter, Mississippi State trying to answer. Will Rogers to Malik Heath. Six-yard score over the top. Then crunch. Matt Corral to Braylon Sanders, the one we saw in Holy Cow, the 81-yard dime. It went down to the wire, but Ole Miss ends up winning this thing 34-21. to Jerry and Ely in here from eight yards out to close. It's just an attitude play. Good Lord, that's attitude. All in your grill. Rebels win. 31-24. All right, let's keep it going. Texas Tech taking on Oklahoma State, number 23. Alan Bozeman here going to get the opportunity for the big Izukama touchdown. 48 yards. Look at that. Pretty ball. And then, oh, oh, the big high step gets himself in the end zone. Texas Tech takes the lead right there, 24-21. to But then the onside kick we saw earlier. Like, if you're going to onside kick it, you got to make sure that Jason Taylor the second doesn't scoop it. <laughs> like peppermint ice cream, and that's exactly what he did. Oklahoma State retakes the lead 28-24. Alan Bowman here. Ooh, read that. Oh, look at that. Interception to Trey Sterling. Returns at 65 yards for a pick six. Oh, Oklahoma State wins a shootout 50-44. to That I'm telling you came down to the wire. We were looking at it saying, Great googly moogly, is it possible? Yes, it is. Uh, and AT&T countdown to the College Football Playoff National Championship. We're going to take a look at the great performance by Florida tight end Kyle Pitts, a monster on the day. Five receptions, 99 yards, but three of those catches went for six points on the board. Number six, Florida beats Kentucky 34 to 10, and Kyle Pitts is now the only player, uh, only Power Five player this season with multiple three receiving touchdown games. And mind you, he missed one. Like he, he is still balling with an unbelievable amount of proficiency. There's a reason he is Kyle Trask's favorite target. The man can ball. Give him a Heisman vote. I'm Big just saying. Fella. I like it. I ain't mad at it. No, it's the best player in the country, not the best quarterback. All right. So let before we get up. Out of here. Yep, you could have just, you could have finished No, I was letting you finish it. I know, okay, no, that's right. I'm sorry, so I should have picked it up. Before we get up out of here, it's the last little bits of content that we want to make sure you see uh, before Why the college football Why do you sound shot. so much better when you say it? That's say it fast person. and confident, baby. Uh, that's all that matters. Wisconsin and Minnesota was canceled, by the way, due to COVID in the Minnesota program. Uh, and that actually ends the longest uninterrupted series in FBS history. These two teams played for 113 straight years. That streak, again, ends uh, with this year's matchup being postponed or canceled, rather, in the Big Ten uh, due to COVID-19 outbreak on the Minnesota program. All right, let's take a look here because we're all sports fans. Let's get to the next one. Earlier this week in the KBO, the Dinos celebrated their first title the best way with a sword, which, by the way, a very He-Man sword, like, so that, you can't tell me that's not like he man and right. the masters of the but, universe. But is it hollow? Is it completely like hollow? Because the way they were just able to sort of lift that thing up, uh, either he has the strongest deltoids in the history of mankind, or or it's like sword in the or, stone, where like if you're the one that is allowed to carry the store, sword. Sure. You can pull it out. like Touché. And, Okay, yeah. Touché. Well, it, it had us thinking of some of our favorite trophies because obviously this was supposed to be rivalry weekend. Yep. I slowed down to say it right, uh, which gives us, you know, crazy trophies to look at. So <laughs> this is some of the best trophies 
Paul Bunyan's axe, you just re- mentioned it. We don't get it this year because of Wisconsin, Minnesota, but it's a little dangerous to give a bunch of college kids an axe, but I'm right. here for it. That feels like a little bit of a line that you're towing there that I don't think you want to cross. Uh, Floyd of Rosedale for Iowa, Minnesota. So a pig. A wow. pig. I mean, Floyd of Rosedale. Let's not disrespect that pig. It's just the pig. I don't, I don't. The golden egg. I just find this to be useful because of the shenanigans that it, that usually ensue. I, in, I'd rather have devil eggs egg personally. Oh, uh, gross. The little brown jug, which to me usually means something that holds whiskey, but apparently it's also something for Michigan, Minnesota. Uh, well, I would not doubt that the players would take that trophy and then fill it with whiskey. But that's, that's true. There. The old oaken bucket. By the way, oaken really got it. Oaken. Yeah, Oaken. that's all I have to say about okay. that one. <laughs> oh, well, the next one is just as weird, the Brass Spittoon. I haven't seen one of these since, like, Looney Tune cartoons. Wow. Okay, that's uh, that's fair. Uh, this one, uh, as a kid born in Vegas, this one is, is special to me, right? The ah. Fremont Cannon, and that's between UNLV and Nevada every year. The Jeweled Shillelagh between Notre Dame and USC is next up here. And uh, what? Yeah. What? Is, that a, is, that a, is that a gavel? I... I, you know, I'm not. <laughs> I'd be so underwhelmed. That is such a historic rivalry. Why is that it? As opposed to the five bits of broken chair trophy? Like, that yeah, one's not great either. Like, yet. Like, I don't want a broken chair. I want a real chair that works. Man, we kind of crapped out at the end. Yeah, well, the, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's no. The bronze stock <laughs> trophy. Got to say that very carefully. Bronze yes, stock. <laughs> Please. Be careful. Boston Collins, your last before we get up out of here. Entry and oh! 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 Oh, hey, no. my God! Hey, so, like, full transparency, some of these plays we don't get a chance to see before they air. And so, yes, if you are appreciating it the same way we are, I promise you that's authentic. That, that yeah. would be 100 on Holy Cow all day, yeah. every day. My oh, yeah. God. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. Like, even on today where I was extra harsh, that's 100. I'm with that. All four. I mean, that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Almost no, yes. as beautiful as getting to sit next to you every oh, Saturday. You're too kind. You're too kind. You know, you can check him out later tonight, by the way, on the wrap-up. Might as well. That. Yeah, let, let's cover it all because I want to show you love, too, the wonderful job. You do all count down to game day with Christine William, Williamson, 8.30 in the morning Eastern on all the little screens that you can see there listed at the bottom. And then at 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern, the college football show at, on, presented by AT&T 5G. And then the wrap-up as uh, my homie Fitz touched on 11 p.m. Eastern. Myself, Gary Strachan, and Christine Williams. Also, rankings reaction back at you on Tuesdays now. And it's 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern with me, Mike Golick Jr., Christine Williamson. All of these same places. We'll get you all the reaction you need every single week. Without question, and we will cover the games like no other right here on the college football show presented by AT&T 5G. We appreciate you joining us. Trent.